Welcome back. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about how we actually deal with multiple texts at once. Because often we'll want to be comparing tens or hundreds or even thousands of different documents against each other. And we'll talk about some of the different ways that computer scientists do that and some of the ways that are useful for people like us in the humanities. Now, in many cases, we'll want to work with multiple different files, but I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how we might divide a text that we have that contains multiple different parts that we want to compare against each other. So let's do this with our homes.txt file. So if you want to, you should go take a look at it to see if you can figure out how you might divide this using some of the methods that we've covered in this class. So I encourage you to pause now and try to figure that out on your own. If you're back, we'll talk about how to do this using the code we have here. I'll be using regular expressions to do this. Here I'm importing the regular expression library as well as this OS library. And this is a library that has a lot of handy functions that let me interact with my operating system. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to load in my text. We've seen this a number of times. And then I'm just going to cut off some of the boilerplate at the end. So if we go and we look at this homes.txt really quickly, if I go to my Hacking the Humanities directory, we can kind of take a look at this together to see what it looks like. Th. If we look at homes.txt, there's some information in here that we don't necessarily need if we're going to do any sort of analysis. For example, if I want to compare the short stories that are in this text, I don't really need this Project Gutenberg boilerplate at the beginning, and I don't really want it at the end either because there's all of this legalese that I don't really care too much about when I'm working with Sherlock Holmes. So if we go back and we look at our code, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go, I'm going to use this text.rfind method, which is just find, go to the back and search forward through the text and find the very last instance of end of Project Gutenberg. And I know that that's where it ends. Um, and I'm going to leave the boilerplate at the beginning because it'll get cut off anyway when I split the texts. So you'll notice if you go through um, this particular set of documents, I'll make this a little larger so we can see what's going on here. Uh, let's make that slightly larger, or smaller, I mean. Let's go back up here. And there are some interesting things that are happening in this text. If we go through, we can look at it and we can see that all of the different stories start with the word adventure, a Roman numeral, and then the title of the text. So if I just search for adventure in all caps, um, I'll go ahead and look for adventure, adventure 2, adventure 3, and so on and so forth. So I can use this knowledge to break this apart using regular expressions. So let's go back here, and we'll take a look at what that looks like. So here is just a very basic regular expression that finds adventure and then a set of Roman numerals, which in this particular case never goes above 90, well, it actually never goes above 12. So I only need i, v, and x. So inside this set, I'm saying I want to match either an i, a V or an X one or more times. And then I want to match a period because it's adventure, Roman numeral, numeral, period, and then there's a space. And then I want to actually capture the title of the story. So here I'm going to say, give me all the capital letters A to Z, a dash, and here you'll notice I'm escaping it. Um, a quotation mark or a space. So what this will do is this will find all of the different titles and because it's inside of a group it's going to return it to me. And of course in order to split I need to give it the text that I'm actually going to break apart. So the way that this the regular expression split works is it will return to me text, captured value, text, captured value, text, and so on and so forth. So the next thing I want to do is I want to just save all of these individual texts into their own file so they can live somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, I'm going to use this OS, dot, uh, this OS library to check first, does a directory called corpus exist? And 
if it does not exist, so if not os.path.isdir corpus, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call os.mkdir corpus. So this will just say, hey, if this doesn't exist, go ahead and just make it up. Create it for me. That way I have a folder that I'm going to save these documents into. Now, the next thing I want to do is I actually want to just delete the first item in that list. So here, when I broke it apart, I called this a short stories list. The very first item is just going to be that Project Gutenberg boilerplate as well as the index. I don't want that, so I'm just going to delete the very first item. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate through every item in this list and use the titles to create a file name and insert the text into that file name. So here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say for i in range 0 to the length of the short stories minus 1, go through all of these items. Then what I'm going to do is because I know that the odd items are the stories themselves and the even items are the titles, I'm going to use the modulo to check if i is even. So if it is, then the item at i is going to be the title. And um, if it's not, the next, if it's not, it's going to be a text. So every time I hit an even number, I'll know, hey, the next item is going to be the text itself. So here I'll just say if i modulo 2 equal equals 0, go ahead and open up a f create a file name for this particular story. So I'm saying go into the short stories list and the item at i add .txt to it because I'm going to save this as a .txt file. And then go ahead and create a variable for the story itself. Short stories i plus 1 is just going to give me the text. Now you'll notice why I'm only going to the length of the short stories minus 1 because if I didn't do this, I would actually try to go beyond the end of the list. So, um, although actually in this particular case I might not ever um, hit the end, but that's fine. So what I can do now is I can just save this short story to file. Now, you'll notice if you've been working with a Windows machine that your, the paths on your computer are formed with backslashes, and I'm working on a Mac, and the paths are formed with forward slashes. Well, in order to write code that works both on Macs, Linux, and Windows system, we can use this OS library to add all of our different path information together using the appropriate directory dividers. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say os.path.join and inside parentheses I'm giving it corpus comma file name. So what it's going to do is it's going to check, oh you are on a Mac, put a forward slash between corpus and the file name. If you're on a Windows it's going to put a backslash really handy thing to know how to do to make sure your code works on all operating systems. So now that I have done that, I'm going to open that file with the right flag, and then I'm just going to write the short story to that file, and then I'll close it up. And ta-da, all of a sudden, now we have a folder full of the individual Sherlock Holmes stories. So if I go ahead and I run this piece of code, What it's going to do is it's going to go through, it's going to divide everything up, and now it's going to save all of that information into individual files. And if we go here, we'll find that there's a corpus folder, and inside this corpus folder are all of our short stories. So this is one way that you might create a corpus for yourself. Uh, in the next section, in the next piece of code, I'm going to talk about how to now go back and open these. Now it might be the case that you don't need to do this. Your, your information is already divided into different files. Um, you don't need to save it in files if you don't have to, but I like to do it just because it makes it easier to reproduce what I'm doing later. So let's go to the next piece of code and see what's happening there. So here we're kind of doing the opposite of what we just did. Instead of writing to these files, I'm going to extract this information. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create an object that's going to contain my corpus. And in this case, I'm just going to use a dictionary. You could use a list or two lists, one for the titles and one for the text. It doesn't matter too much. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the os.walk function to iterate through all of the files in the folder that I'm working with. So we're using this os.walk 
and we're giving it the name of the folder that has all of our texts in it. And you'll notice that this particular line is a little bit longer than you might expect. What this is saying is it says for root, and in this case that's going to be the corpus folder, dears, which is all of the internal folders inside that root folder, and files do something for all of these items. Now the only thing, because our folder, our corpus folder, doesn't have any extra folders in it, we're only going to be using this files list. But you'll see this all over Stack Overflow um, because this is a really handy way of doing it. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for file name in files do something. Now the really nice thing about this is, is I don't need to tell my code what the names of those files are. I can actually just get those out of the directory structure. So then I'm going to say with open os.path.join root comma file name. We saw this os.path in the last piece of code. Um, oh, go ahead and open it as rf. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the title, um, which is just going to be the file name minus the file extension. And I'm going to make it lowercase just for readability. Then I'm going to read the text itself into a short story variable. And then I'm going to save this in this dictionary object. So Sherlock texts, which we've created up here. As the key, I'm going to use the title and then just save the short story. Now we can see that we've successfully loaded all of these texts into our dictionary by checking how long each text is. So here what I'll do is I'll just say for key and value in Sherlock texts.items. We saw this when we were talking about dictionaries. Just go ahead and print successfully loaded key, which is length of value characters long. So we'll go ahead and we'll run this. Uh, Python 22. And we can see that, in fact, it loaded every text in that, cor in that folder, and it tells us how long that text is. So the adventure of the engineer's thumb is uh, 4,400, excuse me, 44,567 characters long. Uh, they're all around 35 to 50,000 characters long. Uh, there's a little bit of variation in there. But you can see that we have now successfully loaded this into memory. So once we have these, core, these uh, documents in memory, what are we going to do with them? Well, there are lots of things that we might want to look at. We might want to look at how they use language in different ways. We might, we might want to see if we can visualize the stylistic relationships between them. This is something we'll talk about when we talk about stylometry. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is let's just load this information in and count up how often all the characters occur in all the different texts. So it's kind of just stepping up what, up what we've done before and now doing it at the corpus level instead of the, at the individual text level. So we'll clear that off. And let's go back to our code. We'll go to the next one, uh, which is going to be talking about term document matrices. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use pandas again to calculate all of the frequencies for all of the words in this corpus. Um, to create what's known as a term document matrix, where we have all of the terms as columns and all of the rows as documents. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is I'm importing NLTK math and OS. Uh, we'll see why we need this math in a bit. We'll import pandas as PD, and we're going to import the series and the data frame. So here we're just loading in our texts straight out of the last piece of code. Um, the next thing I want to do is I'm actually uh, putting in as a list the titles of all of the short stories. Now, you don't have to do this. I'm doing it simply so all of the examples I'm showing you are going to stay in the same order. Uh, we could just say Sherlock text.keys, uh, but it's going to be in a different order than when we do it each time. So this just prevents that. And I'm making the titles lowercase for each of them because you'll remember that our keys are in fact lowercase. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go through each of these items and get the word count for each of the documents. Now I could have done this up here when I'm opening them, but I, I like to keep these a little bit separate. Um, if I were doing this in the context of, my, of real research, I would probably do it right here when I'm opening the files. But I'm just going to go ahead and iterate through every item in this titles list, and I'm saying for I, comma, title in enumerate titles, so here enumerate, 
is just providing an index as we go through this. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the short story text by recalling it out of the Sherlock texts dictionary. And then I'm going to tokenize that text into words. So here I'm just going to say nltk.word tokenize short story, saving that as a tokenized story. And I'll go ahead and clean this up a little bit further by saying word for word and tokenize story if word dot is alnum. So this is just getting rid of the commas, the periods, all of the different punctuation marks. We've seen this before. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a series and get the counts for each of these words, um, like we saw when we talked about pandas. Now the next thing we can do is we can actually concatenate all of these different stories into a single data frame. And here what I'm doing is I'm just saying data frame equals pd.concat short story counts. Axis equals one. This just tells it how to add them together. And I'm saying don't sort anything. So now we have a term document matrix where the terms are rows and the documents are columns. Sorry, I got that backwards earlier. Um, we're going to do some fun stuff with this coming up here in a second. Um, we can turn this into a document term matrix where the documents are rows and the terms are columns by transposing it. We didn't talk about this when we talked about data frames, but if we do df.t, this will just swap all of the rows and the columns. Sometimes we'll need to do this for some of the different mathematical operations we'll want to do. I'll go ahead and run this so you can see what this looks like. And we can see that now what we have is all of the different documents here, uh, document 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 10. These are the different short stories. And the index are the words themselves, and the numbers are the counts. So now we have word counts for all of the different documents. The purpose of this will become very clear here in a moment. And you'll notice that we have not a number, that this is just because um, Walsall doesn't appear in the first of these texts, which is um, a scandal in Bohemia. So uh, we'll deal with that here in a second. The next thing we might want to do is we might want to calculate the TF-IDF. Now we actually have all of the tools that we need to calculate TF-IDF, or term frequency inverse document frequency. And this is a method that computer scientists use to rapidly compare similarities among documents. So what this is, term frequency, is just finding how often a term occurs in a particular document divided by its length. Then we're adjusting that for how many documents in an entire corpus it appears in to rapidly identify terms that are important in a specific document while de-emphasizing words that appear in all the documents. So for example, I don't necessarily care that the occurs a lot in everything. I might want to say, well, the occurs in all the documents, so it's less important to me. Essentially, we're finding distinctive words in all of our documents. So, what we do is we say, let's take our term frequency and multiply it by the inverse of the document frequency. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, if a term occurs in 12 out of 12 of our short stories, we'll multiply whatever that actual score was by 1. But if it occurs in only one of our documents, we'll multiply it by 12 divided by 1. So what this does is it essentially multiplies that score by 12. So it really emphasizes that. Now in actual practice, um, we're going to take the logarithm of that inverse um, document frequency. Because the logarithm of 1 is 0, meaning that we would completely get rid of all of the terms that appear in every document. So in this case, Holmes, Watson, the, and of would all disappear from consideration. So let's actually talk about how do we do that? How do we calculate this using just pandas and the natural language toolkit? Well, let's get into it. So here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to recapitulate all of the code up to the end of the last piece that we just looked at which is when we got our document term matrix. So all of this code is the same up to line 37, where I have saved the transpose of this data frame as DTM, or document term matrix. 
Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to get the term frequencies. So I've been a little bit loose up to this point about what I mean when I say term frequency. Here, what I actually want to calculate is the raw word count divided by the overall length of the document. And Pandas makes this very, very easy to do. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to calculate how long are each of my short stories. I could have done this uh, using the length function earlier, but what I'm going to do here on line 41, so I'm using, I'm using dtm.sum along axis 1. What this means is it's going to go to each row and it's going to add up all of the values in the columns across that row. And because every row is a document, the resulting number is the length of our overall document. What, and what this is going to do is it's going to do it for every document in our corpus because that's what Pandas does. And this is going to return a series with the length of all of our short stories. Then what I can do is because I want the, the term frequency for every term in the corpus, I'll just do dtm.div, so divide, and I'm going to give it that document length series and I'm going to say operate across the index. That is, match up the index from the series to the document term matrix and then divide every single value in the matching rows by that particular text's length. Okay? So the first row is a Scandal in Bohemia, then the frequency in Scandal in Bohemia is divided by the length of Scandal in Bohemia, and the same will go for every term in every document. So what this will do is this will return to us another data frame that I'm calling frequency DTM. And what I can do here is I'm going to go ahead and replace all of the nada numbers with zeros. So I'm using fill NA zero, because otherwise the math that we're about get to, to get into isn't going to work. So the next thing I need to know to calculate the term frequency inverse document frequency is how many documents have every term? To calculate this, I'm going to go back to my document term matrix and use the count method. I'm using this particular variable because it still has those not a numbers in it. And this is just going to go through each column and count up how many rows contain some value. So if the appears in all 12 documents, it's going to give us 12. If it only appears in six documents, it's going to give us a six. And it'll do this for all of the terms in our data set. So once we have the total number of documents something it appears in, we need to get the inverse document frequency. And to do this, we just need the total number of documents we have in our data set divided by the number of documents with a given term. So we know that the, um, this data set has 12 documents in it. I can measure this by just checking the length of the document term matrix, which just tells me how many rows it has. And then I'm going to divide this number by this docs with term series. And this will give me a new series that I'm calling term weight, where for every single term in our data set, we have the length of the of we have the total number of documents in the data set divided by how many documents contain this given word. I hope this is clear. It's a little bit confusing. Now commonly, we can adjust this by taking the logarithm of this particular value. And I'm going to say inverse document frequency equals the term weight dot apply math dot log. So this is just saying go through this term weight and get the logarithm of each of these values. You can see that this actually returns the natural logarithm. Now, I should point something out when it comes to TF-IDF. It's fairly common to add one or add some small number to each term to not get zeros in your data. Um, so for example, if I want to add one to everything, I can say term weight.add one, apply math.log. That way, instead of the having a score of one and getting a log of zero, it'll have a score of two and getting a log that's higher than zero. This makes sure that we don't get numbers that are just completely disregarded. Um, at least for this first demonstration, I'll show you what this looks like without adding that one. So to get the term frequency inverse document frequency, now that I have the frequency document term matrix uh, and the inverse document frequency, I just multiply them together. Frequency DTM dot multiply inverse document frequency. So what this does is this simply returns a TF-IDF matrix. 
okay? Now we can do some really cool things with this, but first let's just look at the top scoring words in the first story, or Scandal in Bohemia. Um, here on line 65, I'm just using squeeze to turn a one row data frame into a series, um, just because it's a little easier to visualize that way. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and sort these values uh, in descending order so the top scoring words are at the top. So let's take a look at this. A lot of build up for a really cool result. So here what I'm going to do, um, this was four. I'll go ahead and run this. And what we'll see is once it's calculated all of these things, we can look at this particular text and we can see that Majesty, Lodge, Briarney, pho Photograph, Irene, Adler, so on and so forth are the important terms in this short story. This is a really, really cool result because it tells us, hey, these are the key words that really determine what's going on here, or at least tell us something about what's going on here. And we can use these to distinguish it from the other short stories. Now, if we go back over to our code, and instead of running this, uh, we add one to everything. It's going to look a little bit different. I'll go ahead and run that again. And you can see that the is all of a sudden going to be much more important here. Um, so now we have these common words, but they're not quite as common as we might have expected. Um, I kind of prefer the result when I got rid of these terms, but this is one way of doing it. Now calculating TF-IDF might seem complicated, but it's a really critical thing to know how to do. Now, in the next piece of code, though, I'm going to show you a way to do it in a much simpler way in terms of the code. Because this is such a common operation, there are pre-built packages that will do it for us. So all of that rigmarole may have been a little bit unnecessary, but it's critical that you understand what's going on underneath the hood, at least in principle. The sklearn library has a TF-IDF vectorizer that will just handle all of this for us. So here what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and import the count vectorizer and TF-IDF vectorizer from sklearn.featureextraction.txt. Okay? And then we've seen this all before. And the next thing we want to do is because this TF-IDF vectorizer is just going to take in our texts, we need to tell it how to break them apart, how to tokenize them. So I'm going to write a little tokenizer function called tokenize text, and I'm going to give it a string. And here we're just going to use our NLTK word tokenize function to break it into words, and then we're going to filter it like we've seen before. Once we've done this, we can actually use it when we're building this TF-IDF uh, vectorizer. So here I'm going to say TF-IDF vectorizer, and I'm going to create this object. I'm going to initialize it and set the tokenizer equal to this function that I just wrote called tokenize text. So essentially, it's going to use this function to break whatever text I give it apart just like I want it. So I'm going to create an object called myVectorizer to or create a variable to save this, and then we're going to go ahead and use it. Now we could create a count vectorizer instead, which is just going to give us the raw counts. So we're going to go ahead and load the corpus. Um, just like we saw earlier, but this TF-IDF vectorizer expects a list of the short stories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of my titles and I'm going to go ahead and append the short stories to this short story list. Then to get the TF-IDF scores, all I need to do is I need to say my vectorizer, which is that vectorizer object, fit transform that list of short stories. This will return a matrix full of these TF-IDF values, and that's all we need to do. But we're going to push it a little further so we can see, in fact, that this is what's happening. So I'm going to get the vocabulary out, and notice that I look at the vectorizer object and not this count matrix, and I'm going to say get feature name. So these are all of the words that went into this particular analysis. And I'll save this as vocabulary. This is just a list of words in the corpus. I'm going to create a data frame to hold this information. That way we can look at it like we just looked at our last instance. To do this, I'm going to need to transform this matrix of scores into a dense array. Um, or why I need to do that doesn't matter too much. It's just because sklearn represents its documents using sparse matrices. 
and data frames don't like those so much. So I'm just inserting this line of code to transfer this into a different format, essentially. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this count array to the data frame object and set all of the columns equal to the vocabulary. And then we'll just go ahead and run the same operation we did earlier to get the values for Scandal and Bohemia. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. What we can see is that we get the exact same ranking order. Now I should point out a few things. These numbers are a little bit different because the way that it adjusts the TF-IDF is a little different than the basic way we calculated it. And it also makes everything lowercase, so the numbers are, uh, and the order is very slightly different. So in this episode, I've talked about term document matrices and TF-IDF and how to open multiple documents so you can actually do some interesting analyses. In the next episode, we're going to be talking about the basics of visualizations and matplotlib. So I hope you're excited about moving forward and starting to visualize some of these differences as we, as we move on. So I'll see you next time. Thank you.